Good. Okay. So, uh, well, thanks for coming to the lecture. And uh, Gunnar, who I guess isn't here, asked me to uh, talk about uh, tensor network states. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, so, uh, so I'm going to give uh, what I hope is a pedagogical introduction to tensor network states. Let me get a pointer. Uh, some might say a plodding introduction to tensor network states. Um, uh, but of course, the uh, you know tensor network states are very general formalism. The field is extremely large, um, and so I can't even in two hours really uh, even scratch the surface of many topics. And so, if you want to learn more about them, um, there are a couple of reviews written in an introductory style, which I recommend. There's a long article by uh, Uli Shovok, which deals entirely with matrix product states. Uh, and then there's a more recent article by Roman Oris, which also deals with uh, some more general tensor network states. Okay, so um, I guess I have to stand. Let me move this. Well, okay, to stand here, so I have to click my slides forwards. Um, so, uh, so this this lecture is in two parts, as you know, the, the two hours, and uh, <coughs> uh, I'm going to start first by just giving you a bit of motivation for why we study tensor network states. Um, and then in the, in the first hour, I'll focus on the simplest class of uh, tensor network states, which are matrix product states. And I'll spend some time going through the graphical notation that we use, just to familiarize yourself with it, because uh, familiarize you guys with it, because all the arguments are conducted in terms of pictures, and we better be familiar with the pictures if we're to understand anything. Uh, then I'll tell you about um, uh, various things you can do in the state so, to, so you get familiar with the algebra of matrix product states. And the, the focus will be on basically how you do computations with them or how you, how you work with them and, and construct uh, algorithms. Okay, so first, a uh, little bit of motivation. Why do we think about tensor networks? Oh, here are all these things I don't cover. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll mention topology just very, very briefly, but most of the things, these other things, I won't talk about. Okay, uh, so, so why do we think about tensor network states? Um, well, well, we'll start with the statement that we all know quantum mechanics is quite complicated. And uh, that was noticed already by Dirac, who, who, who realized that although we know the equations of quantum mechanics, essentially to sufficiently high accuracy to predict most of chemistry and physics, uh, solving the equations is a little bit hard. Um, and if we ask uh, why, why solving the equations is hard, well, it's because if you think about the basic variable in quantum mechanics, uh, that's a wave function. Um, and if I think about the wave function with different kinds of systems, it could be, say, a system of particles or a system of spins. And regardless of the system I think about, uh, as long as there are many components to the system, the wave function is a very high dimensional object. And so just writing down the wave function, let alone determining it, uh, uh, appears to re require exponential complexity because, uh, because it's essentially a function of many, many variables. Um, and in some ways, this is a kind. In some ways, this is a kind of depressing viewpoint because if you if you think that core mechanics really requires an exponential amount of uh, information to represent anything, then it really tells you that it's a really useless theory. I mean, you can write down the equations, but you can't do anything with them. And that viewpoint has been taken by a number of famous people. So here you can take, see, see some quotes. So David Pines and Bob Laughlin, in a sort of typically misguided statement, say the Schrodinger equation cannot be solved accurately where you have more than 10 particles and they make the prediction that no computer existing or that will ever exist can break this barrier because <laughs> the catastrophe of dimension. And of course, famously, Walter Cohen argued in his Nobel lecture that the wave function for system many particles is not a legitimate scientific concept. <laughs> okay, um, so we all know there's something kind of wrong with this though because we do do uh, calculations or manipulate wave functions for systems of many particles, even systems as large as a solid, which has uh, on the order of 10 to the 23 particles. So, so how do we resolve this contradiction? Um, and at the end of the day, the answer is quite simple. It's, it's, it's just the fact that the complexity, which naively appears in quantum mechanics, isn't actually always there. And most of the time, uh, it's an illusion. Um, and another way to state this is that um, uh, that in the particular world that we live in, the particular realization of physics with the, with the particular Hamiltonians and that sort of at low energy scales, um, uh, nature doesn't actually explore the full quantum Hilbert space. Um, so uh, to be more precise, we know that if I were to take uh, uh, a given quantum state, 
It's formally an okay operation in mathematics to write a superposition of two uh, completely different macroscopic quantum states. Okay, that would be forming a Schrodinger cat. Um, but we all know that in the low energy world, with the Hamiltonians that we have, such tile states do not arise naturally. Okay, so we don't have see Schrodinger's cat in the world. Okay, so, 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 so there's some restriction Word right here. So there's, there's some restriction on the types of uh, quantum states that we can actually see uh, in in uh, in the in the actual physics of the world. And uh, once we recognize that, then we realize since physical quantum states have some special structure, then perhaps the exponential complexity isn't there. So long as we know what the special structure of physical quantum states is. Um, and so it turns out that one of the uh, most important characteristics of physical quantum states is this concept of locality. Um, locality simply means that if I, uh, if I poke you, for example, poke, poke this, uh, you don't see something happen on Pluto. Okay? So, so typically, the response of systems is relatively local. Um, and the more mathematical statement is that, is that if we look at the low energy sector of the physical world, the states have very little entanglement. So you, if you do something like a measurement on one point, you do, do not observe correlations uh, very far away. Okay. So, so you can prove that in gap systems that uh, it, you can prove completely rigorously, like that in the sense that a mathematician would consider rigorous, that in one-dimensional gap systems uh, for Hamiltonians which do not have truly long-range interactions, the system must have low entanglement. And then um, for gapless systems, there are corrections, but the corrections are not that big. And then in 2D, you can argue, as a physicist would argue, that this is also true. Okay, yeah, 2D or 3D. At 2D and 3D, you can argue that this is true. Okay for most cases. Okay, and so, so the whole point about tensor networks is it provides a language to, to work directly with only the part of quantum mechanics, only the physical states that have low entanglement, um, rather than working with, so the ordinary quantum mechanics formalism doesn't distinguish between states with low entanglement and these unphysical quantum states. But, but tensor networks provide a natural way to, to, to pick out only these physically, the physically relevant portion of quantum mechanics. And there are many different kinds of tensor networks, which you may have heard of. Um, and they reflect sort of different geometries of entanglement. And the simplest one is the matrix product state. Um, this has a strong uh, Cornell, uh, uh, Cornell link because, uh, in essence, is devised by, by Steve White uh, in the DMRG and building of work by Ken Wilson, they're both Cornellians. Um, and I'll spend most of this first hour talking about matrix product states because they're the simplest ones to talk about and will establish some familiarity with how you think about things. Um, but there are others. So uh, tensor product states in particular, PEPs, are just a generalization of matrix product states to, to describe entanglement in, in multiple dimensions. So matrix product states are mainly su are most suitable for one dimension. And then there are other things uh, like mirror, uh, which, uh, which handle gapless or critical system. Okay, so I'll talk more about these in the second part of this lecture. Right. So I should say I have about an hour and a half of material over two hours, and, and so, so there's plenty of time to stop me and, and, and do so, particularly early on, because if you get lost early on, at the end of two lectures, you'll both be very <laughs> bored and very lost at the same time. Okay, so, so please do stop me. Okay, so, uh, so let's begin, and as I said, uh, we're going to conduct all our arguments in terms of uh, pictures, and so let me introduce some graphical language in a very gentle way. Okay. Um, so, uh, so let's first, start, first write down a wave function, a general wave function. So I have a quantum state, and it's expanded with a set of amplitudes, and here are a set of basis states. And these basis states would be different for different kinds of systems. Um, so if I have particles, then n would, this is for say a system with three sites, then uh, n might be 0 or 1, depending on whether the particles on that site. If I have spins, then n would be up or down. Okay? Um, but anything, it, it, in any case, depending, as, as, with an appropriate choice of these basis states, I can represent any wave function like this. Okay, so, uh, so uh, a wave function is represented by a, a set of numbers. I'm going to call a set of numbers uh, a tensor. Uh, so I don't imply any fancy mathematical properties. I just mean, by tensor, I just mean the set of numbers here, uh, 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 represented by a mathematical object with several indices. Okay, 
How do I represent this as a picture? Well, I'll just draw it, draw it like this. Okay, so, so this tensor here, this uh, object with three indices, is going to be written as a picture with three legs. Each leg is, corresponds to one of the sites. And I'm going to call these legs here, which represent the sites, the physical indices. Okay, so this is a wave function. Pretty simple so far. Um, uh, what about an operator? Okay, so an operator is similarly written in terms of a set of amplitudes in a set of basis states. Um, now I have indices both for the bra and for the cat. And so a general operator can be written by, it can be represented by a tensor, that is its matrix elements. And here's the picture. Okay, so now I have legs for the bra and legs for the cat. So physical indices for the bra, physical indices for the cat. Okay, so not too bad. Oh. If I consider uh, electron electron interaction, yes. can I also like write that? Uh, every, every operator can be written in terms, so, uh, so let me write, so these basis states for particles on a lattice. Imagine you have a one dimensional lattice, so, okay? So then the complete Hilbert space can be expressed in terms of determinants on the lattice, but those are basically states where you can say, well, particle one is here, and particle two is there, and particle three is there, and so on and so forth. Okay, so there's a complete set of states, and then there's a big set of matrix elements, which would be the matrix elements of the Coulomb operator, for example. So the electron would have two upper indices and two lower indices? No, no. So the number, this is uh, for, um, for a lattice of particles, the number of, this is the occupation number representation, so the number of n's here would, if for a lattice with 100 sites, would be 100 of them. We go from n1 to n100. Okay? So, depending on w whether the site is occupied or not. This site is like X-operating. It's like X-operating Hubble. Uh -huh. So, using the many button, I would say, okay. So, it, I mean, you know, the, it, it's we, uh, you know, if, you, if sometimes in particles one works in first quantization, and that might might be the source of confusion. So if that is confusing, then just think of a spin system. So if you have spins, then if you have three, if you have a system with three spins, this would be a system with three spins. It'd be the spin on site one, spin on site two, spin on site three, and this would be the matrix elements in that space. Okay. So most of your O's are going to have very. Most of them will be zero. Yeah, most of these matrix elements would be zero, yeah, yeah. But this is just for a completely general case. Yeah, I've made no restrictions on these operators or these states. Is that okay? Good, okay. But that's, no, that's a good question. Yes, go on. So if you have certain symmetry or Where does it, ha where does it, okay, where does this appear? Well, when you're working in the occupation number form, um, you know, the states are labeled, you know, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, okay? There's actually no distinction between bosons and fermions in the states, right? So in occupation number form, the distinction comes in the commutation relations of the operators. And this is in second quantization, in essence. Yeah? Yeah, okay. Okay, but for simplicity, let's just work with spins. Okay, so with spins, there's no question of symmetries. So, you know, the operator will be SI dot SJ, and don't worry about any computation relations. Okay. Okay, so let's look at some computations. Okay, by computations, I just mean where we sort of reduce something to a scalar, and that's usually what I mean by computation. Okay, so let's look at the overlap between two things. So the overlap between two states I just sum the amplitudes of one state dotted with the amplitudes of the other state. Okay, that's fine. Uh, and we draw that as a picture like this. Okay, so this is the tensor, that's the bra. This is the tensor, that's the cat. And I've connected their physical indices. So it means I'm summing over the indices n1, n2, n3. Okay, that's a picture you'll see a lot of. Okay. How about the expectation value of an operator? So here, again, this is for three sites, wave function on three sites, operator acting on three sites, wave function on three sites, and this is the expectation value. So you're stuck in the operator as a sandwich in the middle, okay, the meat in the middle. Okay, good. 
All right, so this is just general pictures, and you can use this to do all your quantum mechanics, okay? So, but that said nothing about low entanglement states. So let me now introduce a uh, concept of low entanglement states. On, and first I have to say what entanglement is, and I'll say this in a very informal way. Um, so, uh, so what does it mean for a state to have low entanglement? Well, well, let's take the limit when the state has no entanglement. So if a state has no entanglement, and, and let, let's consider the simplest, simplest case where the, the problem at hand has only two parts. So think of it as, say, just two spins. Um, then, then the wave function amplitude for the two spins, spin one and spin two, if there's absolutely no entanglement, just factorizes into a product of amplitude for the first, part, first system and the second system for spin one and spin two. So that what, that's what it means to have entanglement zero. And, um, and if you think of it physically what it means when you have no entanglement, because this wave function, this probability amplitude factorizes, it means that when you do a measurement on the first system, spin one, or you do a measurement on the second system, um, those measurements uh, are completely uncorrelated, or they can be done independently of each other. And that's the criterion for local realism as, as sort of as defined by Einstein, you know, you can, make, you can measure all your physical observables in one region of space and they, they should be completely uncorrelated with something far away. So that's sort of the defining characteristic of, of a classical system. There's no entanglement. All right. Now, what happens when there is some entanglement? Well, in that case, the wave function amplitude doesn't factorize. But if I think of this amplitude here as a matrix, right, it's just an object with two indices, it's like an element of a matrix, then you, you always know that you can break up a matrix into simpler things. So if you generally have an entangled state, this wave function amplitude can be written not as a simple product of amplitudes, but can always be written as a sum of products of amplitudes. And this is essentially a matrix factorization. It's like taking the eigenvectors. Okay. So what does it mean for a state to have low entanglement? So what do you think it means to have low entanglement? What characteristic of the sum would define a low, something without, low, without much entanglement? Well, if there's only one term in the sum, there's no entanglement. So if you have low entanglement, you just have a, only a few terms in the sum. Okay, that's, that's all there is to it. Okay, so, so, so the summation index here is what's generating the entanglement, and something with low entanglement just has a small number of terms in the sum. Okay. What are the I indices? The I indices have no physical meaning as I've defined them so far. They just label terms in this summation, okay? And yes, in this case, there's only one value of the I index. And here, okay, all right. So, um, so a matrix product state, so, so actually this is, the matrix pro this is the matrix product state for a system with, uh, with two spins or a system with two parts. You just write it like this. Um, but the matrix product state, uh, for a general system with many parts, um, uh, just writes your wave function as a sum of products of amplitudes on each of the subsystems. And so let me just show you, the, show you it's easy to sort of just show you exactly what it is. So here's a wave function amplitude for L spins, for a lattice of L spins. Um, and I've now written it as a sum of amplitudes for, for site 1, site 2, site 3, all the way to site L. And you notice that I'm summing over some additional indices which are putting in entanglement between the sites. So see this index I1 here is putting in entanglements between site 1 and site 2, site 2 and site 3, and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is the matrix product state. It's just a way of rewriting the wave function amplitude in terms of little bits that live on site 1, site 2, site 3, and so forth. Okay, you notice that the particular way that I reassembled amplitudes on the individual sites and so the total amplitude has a sort of one-dimensional structure. So I put an entanglement between site one and site two, site two and site three, and so on and so forth. Again, this is why matrix product states are ideal for one-dimensional systems. Um, and we call this additional index that is that we're summing over, we call it a bond, a bit like a chemical bond, uh, or sometimes we call it the auxiliary dimension. And and it's sometimes labeled by different things in the literature, but they're all the same thing. Okay. Um, in this particular representation, the first site and the last site are only, don't, can only entangle either to the right or to the left. And this, so this represents 
So they have one fewer index. So this has only got one index, whereas you see this one has got two bonds. This one's only got one bond. So this is a matrix product state for a system with open boundary conditions. Go on. Why can't they form a ring? You could. So I've written this one down here for a system with open boundary conditions. So that's got an end. And, but if it had a ring, then they would join around. Okay. Yes. Yes. So how is so? Does this state have no entanglement between site one and site three? Well, the answer. That's just arbitrary entanglement to choose. Well, you could choose to connect them in any way, but in matrix product states, we always connect them site one to site two, site two to site three, and so forth. But there's entanglement between sites one and site three simply because if site one and site two are entangled, and site two and site three are entangled, then there is some entanglement communicated along. But it's certainly true that there's less entanglement between sites one and three than there is between one and two or two and three. Okay, yes. I'm sorry, I still don't quite get the significance of I. So when you said that there is a small number of terms in the summation, is that a basis independent statement? Is that a basis independent no. So well, not strictly, but I mean if I rotate my basis states, entanglement is not invariant to rotations of the basis. Yeah, but but the the point is um, the in the physical states working in a local basis um, should have low entanglement. Okay, so uh, and that means that if I were to rewrite a physical quantum state, so physical set of amplitudes in this form, then there should not be many terms in the summation. Well, that's a statement. Okay. Yes. So as you increase the number. I, yes. The range of the I. Yes. Uh, is, is this guaranteed to give you a general state? Yes, this is a complete parameterization. You don't have to directly connect N1 to N3. No. You can ma mimic any kind of second neighbor interaction with yes. entanglement caused by second neighbor interaction by going through two. Yes, you can. Maybe it may not be very efficient, but in principle you can always do it. It's guaranteed. So, so the upper limit of i to reach this ideal limit is? Well, uh, it's the square root of the Hilbert space dimension, strictly speaking. But That's just, just the practical one, right? No, no, that, that will, uh, in a finite Hilbert space of dimension p, then i has to be square root of p. That's the maximum entanglement that can exist in that state. But essentially, just think of i as going up from up to infinity. Yeah. So just, to, just to make sure. Uh, yes. And so I assume in principle it is possible for the A of the first A yeah. and the last A yes. to be both matrices, both having two indices. Yes. It's like taking a trace of That's angle, correct. Yes. But we're not talking about it. Right? That would be I will mention that later as a period as that but that's one where you're on a ring, you know? So it's not like the ring in the physical space, it's a ring in eyes. It's a ring in eyes, but you could imagine that it's appropriate to describe a set of sites arranged on a ring. Right. Yeah. Okay. You could use that ansatz for something that's not on the ring. Yeah. Yes. Go on. So how do you know? Um, so I assume like that this formula sort of basically depends on dividing your system into areas which are tangled in some ways. Yeah. I mean, if we we think about uh, as the the most natural system that one could have as a toy is a spin system. Yeah. yeah and so you have spin one, spin two, spin three. So it's, this is for for discrete system. This is for a discrete set of degrees of freedom. Okay, so I no. guess it's possible that you choose a for your, I guess, basis. Yes. Let's say you divide it into subsystems, and it could be that the subsystem technically uh, consists of two parts which aren't entangled. Correct. Which aren't entangled. Yeah. Yeah, so you, you read, yes, you so could. Do you know which, which uh, is the best way to do this? So every subsystem is not entangled. It's like one way to entangle if you consider it alone. Um, so we assume that the, that the structure of the entanglement, the easiest way is to assume that the structure of the entanglement is sort of reflected in the physical structure of the system. So things that are close together have more entanglement. Degrees of freedom closer together have more entanglement than degrees of freedom far apart. Um, this is also kind of what locality means. The things that are close together more entangled. It's not always true, okay. um, but it, even if it's not true, it's okay. I mean, this is a com this is a completely general ansatz. It's ideal if you know site one and site two are more entangled than site one and site three, but you can still entangle site one and site, th site three by kind of entangling through through so this. That, one. So that means that's not as efficient though, as if you chose it so the areas are not entangled. 
it's not sufficient to well, choose. I mean, efficient. It's not efficient. Yeah. It's um, yeah, it's not efficient to. So imagine that I had uh, sort of a hundred sites, yeah. and you know, in general, the sites that are close together and lattice are most entangled. But let's imagine that some some person gave you these sites in a random order. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then if then the entanglement would be, look very strange. You know, site one would be entangled with site fifty-seven. And so if you use this, it would not be particularly efficient representation of this random entanglement which had no locality in it. So, okay, so like given that um, structure that they gave you, how would you... How would you know? Yeah, how would you know and also how would you... Could you convert that into a more... Yeah, so someone was very devious and gave you such a thing, but a more practical example is actually when we use this ansatz in some systems where the, the entanglement structure is not so clear, there, there are various heuristics that you can use, which is um, I can draw, draw out, it can measure entanglement between the points, and it looks like some graph, and I can try and re rearrange the graph to make the entanglement look local. So I can physically try and reorder the labels of the sites using that way. But, but let me assume that I'm working for one dimension. <laughs> okay, let me assume that I'm going to work in a one dimensional system where the sites are arranged in order, and I'm going to use the ansatz in that way. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to move on, Cyrus, because it's you. you. You can move on. All I was saying is the question is relevant when you go to two or three dimensions, obviously. That's correct, but I'm going to assume I'm only working one dimension. Okay, very quick. So, okay. Okay. so my understanding is like you, you actually, you, um, the, you expand your uh, entangled, entangled state into non-entangled representation, then except for these kind of matrices nearly diagonalized, but it's not exact. Is that true? Or, or uh, I, I can't exactly underst understand what you're saying. I mean, so like in a precise way, but um, we are not removing any, I'm going to, I'm, I'm taking a general quantum state, making no assumptions about it, and rewriting it exactly like this, okay? So there's, I'm not making an approximation currently. Okay. okay, in the same way that if I take a matrix, I can always rewrite it exactly through its singular value decomposition as a product of things. There's no approximations being made currently. I'm just saying I can rewrite things like this. Okay. Okay. All right. So, uh, so the, w you might ask why, why is something called a matrix product state? Okay. And so it's because if I pick out a certain set of values for the physical indices, so let's say I want to lower the amplitude for spin up, spin up, spin up, spin down, spin down, spin down. Okay, so these indices are fixed. Then you notice that once I fix the top indices, then the objects just have their bottom indices, and so this is just a matrix. You know, it doesn't have the top index matrix, and so the amplitude is obtained by a product of matrices. Okay, so that's why it's a matrix product state. Yes? Can it give you a constant piece in the entanglement tree? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, those are all complicated questions, right? <laughs> it's really at the very beginning. So, which is which is good, which is good. But we hopefully we'll get to some of them. Okay. So, <laughs> so this is a general state. I've written it like this. Okay, general tensor. No, it's good to ask all these questions. But we'll, we'll, and and uh, and here I've just rewritten it. I've just rewritten it as a matrix product state. Okay. So here's a general tensor, and I've rewritten it as a sum of objects on the individual sites, and those objects are contracted together. All right, so this tensor, matrix product state. This is an equivalence. There's no approximation going on right now. This is the first tensor A here, second tensor, third tensor. Yes, go on. Uh, so I'm, like I'm not saying that the A's on site 1 are the same as the A's on site 2. Oh, it's just... A and 1. Okay. Yeah. So your matrix on site 2 can be different. Yes, so yes, yes. Like yeah, because it's, otherwise the notation is very complicated. Like if one is spin off and 2 is also spin off. Like Say that again? Say, if you assume that N1 is spin off. So N1 can be spin up or spin down, yeah. right? Yes. So okay. it can take two values. Yes. Yeah. Yes. No, I mean, like, if N1 is spin up and N2 is also spin up, yeah. right, the matrix, like, A spin up is also equivalent to the matrix. Uh, no, no. So if N1 is spin up and N2 is spin up, the values of those two matrices I'm not assuming are the same. 
they're distinguished by the position in, the uns in this thing here. Yeah. Okay. Otherwise, I'd have to write a1, n1, a2, n2, and it just becomes a little complicated. But everything's easier when you draw a picture. So here it's quite obvious that this, I'm not assuming, is the same as this. Okay. All right. All right. So, um, so an important thing to notice is I've written this general state as a matrix product state, the sum of products of things on the individual sites. This, this representation is not unique. Okay. So uh, a product of things is not not unique. If I take a pro so if I take a times b, right, I could multiply a by two and b by one half, and the product of the two things is still the same. Hopefully that that, that mathematical truth is clear. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, same is true for a matrix product. So I can multiply a matrix by some arbitrary matrix, and the other matrix by its inverse, and the product will be the same. Okay. So you so matrix matrix product states have a gauge degree of freedom. This is an important point in the topological study of these things, okay? but, but I won't talk too much about that. So matrix current states have a, have a gauge um, on the auxiliary indices, which you can choose arbitrarily. So if I introduce an arbitrary matrix, G, G inverse, so th this is an identity, and this is the identity in graphical form. So G times its inverse is just a line or, or just a chronic delta. Okay? So these two things cancel out. And so, if I take this matrix product state, and from now I'm really just going to use these pictures. So let, hopefully this picture is clear. Okay, so this is a matrix product state. If not, please stop me. Um, I can insert an arbitrary product of G and G inverse in between these two tensors, and it's still the same product. Okay, so that's the gauge degree of freedom. Um, and I can group this this matrix multiply onto the left and put that one and multiply onto the right and obtain a different matrix product state representation of the same state. Okay, so this is the same identity. All right. Okay, so now let's look at some computations. So let's now compute the overlap. Okay, so this is the overlap. So it's just like before, I have a bra that's a matrix product state and I have a ket that's a matrix product state. And um, how do, you how do you actually compute this thing in practice? Well, remember that each of these individual objects is, is some small tensor, and you can compute these overlap in pieces. So I can compute, contract the first tensor, the first site tensor with the bottom site tensor. So contract this part here, and then put on the second site tensor, and then contract the second site bottom tensor. And now I've got to the same position as here, and then I add the third sites, and then the fourth sites, and so on and so forth. Okay, so you contract it along this direction, and that gives you the efficient computational scheme. All right, so total overlap is polynomial, and it's, it's, linearly, it's linear in the number of sites of the system. D is the dimension of the physical index, and it's two for spin system, up or down. Okay. M is the dimension of the bond, bond which can be very big. Okay, so, uh, so I sort of just defined what a matrix product state was, and, and just to show you that it's a completely general construction, so I can represent any quantum state as a matrix product state. Now let's write down an algorithm to construct a matrix product state representation of an arbitrary quantum state. Okay, so I'm going to turn an arbitrary state into a matrix product state. All right, so uh, it's, it's all based on, uh, the, the simplest way is to think of, well, is think of a single value decomposition, but if you don't know what the single value decomposition is, it's a little bit like the eigenvector decomposition. It's a little bit like finding eigenvectors. It's a little bit more general because if the matrix is not symmetric or has non-negative or has negative eigenvalues, then, then the single value decomposition is sometimes more useful. Okay, but anyway, when you have a set of matrices, when you have a matrix, the so wave function for two sites just looks like a matrix. So it's got two indices, N and M. You can write it in in a single value decomposition in terms of left singular vectors, right singular vectors, and singular values. Okay, that's a singular value decomposition. Like the eigenvector decomposition, this would be like eigenvectors, eigenvectors, eigenvalues. Okay, um, there are some special properties of the singular vectors. They are orthogonal to each other. Okay, so the left singular vector, this is an orthogonal matrix. Right singular vector, this is an orthogonal matrix. Okay, so let's turn this into pictures. So this is my matrix, it's got two legs, wave function for two spins, and I've pulled it apart and stuck singular values in the middle. All right? This is left singular vectors, right singular vectors, singular values. And so this is, this is 
what means to turn a matrix product state, uh, to turn a, turn a state into a matrix product state. This is how I rewrite as a matrix product state. And this is the orthogonality condition. So if I take my left singular vectors and contract them, it, they, they give a Kronecker delta. And if I take my right singular vectors and contract them, I get my right, I also get a Kronecker delta. Okay, so, so that's how you turn a two-side wave function into a matrix product state. Let's now do this for a general state. So let's say the general state has three sides. Um, and so you just do a set of singular value decompositions. So I cut the system down here, and I pull out site one, and I think of site two and site three as the second half. And let's pull it apart. And so you can pull it apart by singular value decomposition, and you insert some singular values there. This stuff is still stuck together. Site two and site three is still stuck together. So for site two and site three that are still stuck together, I need to pull them apart. So I think of the singular value, this bond here, and this index as the first part of the system, and site three is the second part of the system. And I now pull that thing apart, insert some singular values, and I get a structure like this. All right. And so when you put it all together, here's my first tensor of the matrix product state, here's my second tensor, here's my third tensor, and so I will have my matrix product state decomposition. Okay, and so you can do this for any number of sites. Of we see? Yes, go on. So previously when you do the decomposition without a single value matrix, without a single value decomposition, you said it's completely general. Yeah, well you can always absorb the singular values into the tensor. It's just another way to, to decompose the state. Yeah, so I wrote down a formula a few slides back when I talked about entanglement, where I wrote a summation with no singular values. Right. Yeah, so that's just to make it simple. But, uh, th this is, but singular values I can always just absorb. It's like a gauge. I can put it in here, put it in here, yeah. But this is to make this for some convenience purpose for the future. Um, sometimes it's useful to explicitly have the singular values around. Um, and other times you just absorb them into the... So just an alternative. Yeah. I mean, it's still a matrix product state with a gauge in the middle, basically. Gauge. Yeah. 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 Yes, yes, it, it helps because basically it gives you these orthogonality conditions. It gives, makes, it's useful for real computation where it's nice to have things orthogonal. Yes? In the original definition, you have a sum of i. Yes. Here, there is no sum of i, right? There is summations of i's. So, what is a summation? A summation means joining things together. So, this is a summation here of a i. So let me go back to the previous slide. Okay. Here's the summation over i, over the index linking the singular values. That's this here. See, i and i. All right? Okay. Whenever I connect two objects, it's a summation. So this is stuff connected together. So there's a summation there. These i's are the bond indices. These are the bond indices. Not the I don't, don't know what that, I'm not sure what you're saying, but yes. They, but the statement that the eyes are the bond indices is true, yes. Okay, all right. Okay, all right. So, is that okay, Wei? No, let's make sure it's all clear because it only gets worse. <laughs> so, um, I'm taking a matrix and this is, the, this is a matrix, it's got two indices, though I've written it in a funny way, but this is really a matrix. I've just put the row index on the top and the column index on the bottom. Right, so this, this to me is like the matrix times the diagonal matrix. The matrix times, times the diagonal matrix, matrix times another right. matrix, yeah. So this would, I would imagine this is like A, I, 1, I, 2 times A, I, 2, I, 3, for example. A, I1, I2 times A, yes, I2, I3, right. that's correct. But then on top of that, there was a sum over I. Oh, the summation over I there was the summation over I2. So, in other words, I had written... The I means I1, I2, I3, all of them. I hope this is not permanent marker, but if I write <laughs> psi... You can think of that central sigma as as a diagonal matrix delta uh, ij times uh, sigma i, 
No, no, the problem, the problem is that this is, is RJ. What problem is that the sum of i is just down in this. You, you can think about this as a three matrix kind of here. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but what bothers me is that in the beginning, when you write down. But, but this is a special case where the middle matrix is a diagonal. Yeah, yeah, but that's not bothering me. Where okay, so here, let's go here, okay? So this is summation over i, right? <laughs> Summation of i. So this sum of i here we mean, means sum of i1, sum of i2, sum of i3. That's so what it's. Don't look at the first one in that. Look yeah, the so, one. so the second one is just one it's matrix okay. product, right? There is no sum over in the, in the second line. Yeah, here, yeah, yeah yes. Matrix times this matrix. is just a product matrices, that's yeah, correct. Summation. Yes, but that's the same. Uh, that, the, I mean, this is, this is a. This is just a matrix product. So if I wrote this in matrix, so I, I get this part. Yes, yes. Yeah, this is so L times R. The very beginning, when you introduce the, uh, the A product of A. Here. Right here. Right? Uh, so this is. Oh, that's what you okay. Yeah, OK. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. <laughs> what was that? Hold on for a second. Rewind. OK. So if, when you have no entanglement, a1, uh, a n1 times a n2, is that a matrix product? This is an outer product of two vectors. Vector. Yeah, awesome. basically, yeah. Which is kind of a, a kind of matrix. Okay. But, all right. Where did I go to? Oh, okay. All right. Yes. So you say in this graphical notation, you don't need to label label each of those uh, circles by L or R or something. Right. But this I, this IJ thing is equal to delta IJ. So the, yeah, that thing is equal to delta IJ only if both of those circles are the same L. That's right, yeah. But you said it doesn't, it's not necessary to label. It's going to be implicit in your head that oh, I put okay. the same so thing here. That means I should still label them if I yeah, it's a, if you would like to, you can, you can put labels on them. Yeah. Okay. So I, I, to avoid mistakes, I should still label each of those. Yeah, I mean, you know, in the operation that we're doing, it's not very complicated. I know I took this, and then I'm, you know, I know myself that this is the same as that one when I'm writing it down. But if you try to communicate to someone else who does just this picture, it's not sufficient information. Cause, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So in the beginning, you said then the uh, states are not entangled, and oh. you didn't have to sum over the i's. Yes. They're entangled, you have to sum over the i's. Now you have presented a more general construction where it's a product of matrices. Yes. Where by construction, we have to sum over i's. Yes. Right. So now, can you differentiate so, this i versus the It's the same i, but in the state with no entanglement, if I would look at the singular values, there would be one singular value, which is 1, and everything is 0. Yeah? OK. So do the circles uh, still have gauge terms? Do the circles still, you can still gauge them by sticking in the gauge matrix G and G inverse in them. Yeah, but then that's going to change the, the diagonals. Yes, yes, OK, correct. So in other words, so that's really my next slide. OK, so, um, so, there, so this is a, a way of constructing a matrix product state, and it actually defines a particular gauge. So. Um, so here I've turned a general state into this particular way where each of these tensors satisfies orthogonality conditions, which is, which is a way of fixing the gauge. Um, and and you know, if you have something with gauge degree of freedom, then, then there are sort of convenient forms that you like to use, the canonical forms, which fix the gauge in a certain way. So this fixes a particular gauge, which is a Vidal gauge. Um, and in different, there are other different canonical forms, which are ways of defining other gauges. I can absorb my singular vectors, say, to the right. So this is the so-called left canonical form. Okay. So, okay, so, and then I could absorb them to the left. Right, and this is, so these are all equivalent ways of writing down, the, writing down a matrix product state, but depending on where you, whether you absorb the singular values in at all, or you put them to the right, you put them to the left, you get different common ways of, of writing down a matrix product state. And then a particular important one for computation, which is really the basis of DMRG, is the so-called mixed canonical form, where I pick a particular site, say site 2, you pick a special site, and then everything to the left, the singular values absorb this way, everything to the right, the singular values absorb that way. Okay. 
and that's the DMRG form. Okay. Yes? When you say here we have, which, uh, are you pointing at this, this, or this? No, just in, in, the, in the first form, in the pre-load form. The yes. The two has any properties. Two has no particular properties in this Only form. Only the ends do, but two has a special, two has the, the, two plus this fragment here, two and three all together have, a, have an orthogonality condition when stuck together. Yeah? Okay, so there's only, I will mention mixed canonical form very briefly later because I, I do want to explain how the DMRG works. Um, so the only thing you have to remember is if I'm saying I'm using mixed canonical form, then all the tensors to the left or to the right of a particular site, when contracted with themselves, give you identities, okay, give you a Kronecker product. So that's just some phrase which may not be completely clear at a technical level right now, but I'm going to use that phrase later. Okay, so let me go on to the matrix where it operates. So we, um, I'm going extremely slowly, which is okay, and hopefully, okay, so that's perfectly fine, but we have to, when am I going until? Um, so the, the original end of your two hours is 12.30. Okay. And so... We start 10 minutes late. We start right? 10 minutes late. Okay. You know, All right. We'll okay, so we've got... At some point. Okay, so good. All right. <laughs> That's no, no problem. I mean, I can, the slide, you will have all the slides, you can read the slides. We'll read, okay. All right, so let me now talk about operators, okay? So we're used to, we just talked about matrix product states. Now let me talk about matrix product operators. So in the same way that I could write my state down as a product of bits on each site, I can also write down a general operator. This is an operator acting on L sites as a product of little operators that act on site one, and on site two, and on site three. Notice an operator has both a bra and a ket index. So this operator on site one has both a bra and a ket index. So operator on site one, site two, site three, and then all the operators are entangled. Okay, so a matrix product operator is a way of writing down a general operator as an entangled product of operators on all the sites. Okay, so this is my general operator, and you can probably picture in your head how I now write this down, this equation down, this is my matrix product operator. It's just analogous to a matrix product state. Um, so we call this an MPO. And for many physical reasonable operators, this matrix product can be, it doesn't need very many. Uh, doesn't need many terms. Yes, yes. So, uh, so typically, right, doesn't need many terms. And to understand what this operator entanglement is, let me kind of talk about the physical meaning. So, so we're, we're used to uh, thinking about, or we, we might be used to think about entanglement in the Hilbert space and for, of wave functions. In terms of operators, it's a little bit perhaps less familiar. So let me just think about how we think about entanglement for operators. So this is a Hamiltonian that is the Heisenberg Hamiltonian. So IJ means nearest neighbors. So spins and nearest neighbors are coupled together. So let me think about how I write this down as a matrix product operator. And so, and, and in particular, I'm just going to ask the question, if I wrote this down as a matrix product operator, a sum of products of terms on each of the sites, what would the bond dimension be? Does anyone know the answer? If you know the answer, you probably work with matrix product states. <laughs> okay. All right, we'll see. Okay, so let's just take, for example, a system with four sites. This is the MPO for four sites, the general representation. Um, and to think about what the bond dimension is of this Heisenberg operator, Heisenberg Hamiltonian, you basically take a cut. So to look at what the bond dimension is here, you basically take a cut of the system. So you just take the system, say, call this the left system, and the right, call this the right system. And then you ask, well, how many terms in the Hamiltonian act between the left and the right system? So to, to be precise, let me show you so what well, the answer is, so if I write this Hamiltonian in terms of things that act in the left system, the right system, you can think of it as a Hamiltonian, the part, the, the part in the summation which acts in the left system, times the identity, plus the identity acts in the left system, times a, times a, a Hamiltonian which acts on the right. Okay? 
and then times all the couplings between left and right. So this would be S2x times S3x, S2y times S3y, S2z times S3z. Right? So this would be a general way of writing down a Hamiltonian in terms of bits on the left and bits on the right. And there are five terms. And so the matrix product operator dimension is five. So how do you define bond dimensions? How do I define bond dimensions? The bond dimension was in the previous slide, just this very uh, abstract object, the dimension of these indices connecting the tensors. Right. So the dimension of the eyes. So it's, yeah, it's like basis dependent and everything. Yes, it's basis dependent, but le again, let me think I'm working uh, for a spin system where the basis I'm choosing is the spins on the sites, yeah, the spin states on the sites. You're, you're saying it depends on the basis of label by the N, but not the basis labeled by the I. There is no... In this, the, uh, the way that I've been talking about things, there is naturally a basis associated with n, which would be spin up, spin down, and i is just a fictitious thing, which, right, right. okay. But you can think of the label i also as a vector component in this index. The i index yes. is the basis independent. The i index. Yeah, because yeah, you're summing over it. So, so uh, if I... Yeah, I mean, you could, so changing the basis of this I would be inserting a transform, like a, a transformation of the I. It's like, that's like a gauge transformation, yeah. Yeah, so, but, yeah, it's, um, uh, Yeah, so you were saying the bound dimension doesn't, it's not affected by your different way of, you said, no, different way of writing your I. Different ways of writing the I's. Yes, so strictly speaking, I, uh, so if I forget that there are any n's here, that, so let's say there are no n's at all, then this is just an element of a vector. Right. Okay, and so you might be thinking, well, it's an element of a vector, then formally I can think of that vector as having a basis representation. Okay, and I could change the basis representation, which would change the elements of the vector. That's completely true. That's equivalent to inserting this gauge matrix, okay, which is multiplying a gauge matrix here would be multiplying into this bond. Yeah. The eyes do have, a have an interpretation as a basis, actual physical basis, and they're the basis of renormalized states in the real space renormalization group, but we won't get to that right now. Okay, all right. All right, so, yes? Yeah, that's what this bracket means, yes. Oh, I just use the nearest. Yeah, I, I'm using that notation to mean the nearest. Okay. All right, so let's think about a computation, an operator acting on a state. So here's a state. Here's an operator. And to act an operator in state, you glue, together, glue them together. That's the operator acting on the state. So a matrix product operator acting on a matrix product state gives you a matrix product state. This is just a matrix product state. But if the matrix product state has a dimension m1, matrix product operator's dimension m2, then the, this resulting matrix product state has the product of the dimensions. Okay, so if you have a matrix product state with a certain amount of entanglement and you apply an operator to it, typically you increase the entanglement. Okay. All right. All right. So, this leads me now to a set of two algorithms which I'm going to discuss. Um, one, is, one is compression, the other is DMRG. So, you, you can imagine that if in any co computation quantum mechanics, you're usually acting operators on states, the operator acting on state will increase the entanglement. Um, and so, it's important then, uh, just practically, perhaps, if you're a practical person like me, that you want, to re you want to sort of somehow control how much entanglement grows. Otherwise, you can't compute with it, and you can't do a computation anymore. And so, the first sort of non-trivial algorithm I'm going to introduce is the compression of a matrix product state. So, imagine that you've generated... Yes, go on. Yes. Uh, uh, what's the minimum number, the bond dimension number for a matrix product operator can have? One. It could just be one. So, th then it would just be a simple product. So, if I simply take SZ, times S Z. Uh, but you have that's one, just right, right. That, yes. That part gives you two. Oh, uh, 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 let's see. So um, if I literally just have S1 dot S2 and nothing else, then that would just have one dimension one. I mean, if I simply took a weird Hamiltonian that only had a term that acts on site one and site two, that would have one dimension one. If you had a Hamiltonian which is summation over S Z's, 
then you would have, I think, one dimension two. That's correct. Because you need to include the SE dot one and one, or maybe one dimension three. Yeah, one dimension three. Sorry, when you just counted the one dimension for the Heisenberg Hamiltonian. Yes, five. that's five. I understand this three part, but the, the two part. So the five comes because I had a summation here. But if, right, it's related to having a summation, which is why this HL contains the sum over all terms acting on the left. This right contains the sum over all terms acting on the right. But if I made a weird operator that, that even if I had just 100 sites, only acted on site 1 and site 70, and it was just SC1 times SC70, the bond dimension would be 1. Or if I took the identity operator, the bond dimension would be 1. Yeah. Yes? I'm a bit confused about the bond dimension. Like yes. I think of the uh, Hamiltonian and think of like separating them as like a single level decomposition. Yes. Right. So, for example, I have this uh, big tensor to start with. Yes. And I rearrange it in a matrix where you know that's one not what are labeled by one and rows are labeled by. Yes. Seven. That's that yes. Matrix is kind of pretty huge. Yes, that's correct. But that's not what we're doing because I mean you're saying if I had a hundred sites, yeah. the, the and it spins. The dimension of that matrix would be 2 to the 100 and 2 to the 100. Right. And then I do an SVD. Okay? But re remember, in this representation, I'm doing many, many SVDs. Okay? This is gen if I have 100 sites, I generate this by 99 SVDs. And the SVD is done by rearranging the matrix in a certain way. So in initially, the row would just be for site 1 and site 2. So it would just be of dimension 2. And the rest would be 2 to the power of 99. The rest, 99 spins. Okay, and then you do the others. So you do many, many SVDs. So it's not the same. I'm not constructing it through one SVD in the way that you're, you're describing. Maybe I can ask a little bit. Okay. The key about SVD is it's a very effective way of pulling up other important things. Right, right, right. And so, and so the fact that he's got a five dimensional bond dimension. With, you may be able to throw away some of those dimensions uh, and, and get a simpler description that captures the way function almost as well. Right, and I, I understand that, but uh, I was just wondering, like, if you keep doing, say, if you start from the left and start doing the SVDs to the right, yes. if you progress the size of the matrix will grow. Yes, but I'm, I'm kind of showing you sort of in some explicit way because. Yeah, I, I kind of show you because this is a very special thing, the bond dimension doesn't grow. Okay. okay. This is not doing a general wave function, it's doing a particular operator, okay. which, which has no longer a bond and therefore the Okay. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so, so now maybe let me talk about how we do compression of a matrix product state. So imagine that you've done your computation and you've got a matrix product state with enormous bond dimension and you want to shrink it down. Well, how do you do that? The easiest way is to uh, uh, write your matrix product state in the particular gauge where the singular values appear. Okay, so I showed you a way to, to turn an arbitrary state into a matrix product state with some single values on the bonds. I showed that a few slides ago. So imagine that you just do this with a matrix product state, and I do set SVDs, which put singular values on the bonds. And then the simplest way to reduce this matrix product state from a large bond dimension to a small bond dimension is to look at these singular values that now appeared on the bonds, so many, large, many singular values, and throw away the small ones. So I just replace this matrix product state, which has, say, M1 singular values, by a smaller matrix product state where I've taken only a subset of the singular values. And this is equivalent to truncating this bond. And so that's the simplest way to compress the state. And this is known as, uh, uh, this is known as SVD compression. Um, there, it's not the optimal way to do things. And, um, because when I'm throwing away information of these singular values, I'll throw away information of these singular values, I'm doing it independently of each other. Whereas you might imagine that if I threw away some information on this bond, I should sort of re-optimize this bond or do, do something different on the second bond. So this is just a very simple way. It's very easy to, to do, very easy to write, write a program to do this. Um, but let me now introduce a slightly better way of doing it, which is variational compression. This will introduce DMRG. Okay. 
All right. So, so the better way to compress a matrix product state is just to solve an optimization problem where you just say, if I have an initial matrix product state I want with large bond dimension, I want to find a good approximation with smaller bond dimension. Okay, so psi is the original matrix product state, and this red thing is the new matrix product state with small bond dimension. So I want to minimize the difference between the states, and you can do some algebra and multiply it out, and you'll find that you can minimize just, it, it turns into two terms. One of the terms is just psi, psi, which is just one. Okay, so I need to minimize this, and uh, and let me write this down in graphical notation. So I'm minimizing the sum of these two terms. So this black light, this black matrix product state is my original matrix product state. And this red stuff here is the new matrix product state that I want to optimize. So that's a linear term, and this is a quadratic term. So this is my new matrix product state traced with itself. Okay, so I want to minimize this, this plus this. All right, so it's a minimization. And how do you minimize something? Does anyone know? <laughs> Numerically, you evaluate the gradient of the thing, the derivative with respect to the elements of the thing, and you follow the gradient. Okay, so that's all you do, but let's just see what you do. So, so we follow its gradient. So I need to differentiate, I need to differentiate this expression with respect to the elements of these matrices to find the gradient. That's the gradient. Okay, so it's a derivative of, say, the first term with respect, let's say I'm trying to optimize the second tensor. It's the derivative of this object with respect to the elements of the second tensor. And this, this whole expression here, the second tensor just appears once. It's linear in the second tensor. So if you differentiate a linear, something that's linear in the variables, this thing just disappears. So I get this expression. Okay, so that's how you do calculus with matrix product states. Right? You differentiate and you delete it. Um, and similarly, now let me differentiate this overlap, and the second tensor appears twice. Okay, so it's quadratic. And so you can imagine you just get two times that. Okay? All right, quite easy. All right. And so so this defines the gradient. So if you think thinking about this, this is an object with three indices, object with three indices. So it defines a, a tensor with three indices, okay, three indices. They just add these things together. And this tensor that I'm optimizing, this second tensor, is also something with three indices. And in the gradient algorithm, I would just add on the gradient. And that optimizes the tensor. All right. And so if you just keep doing this again and again and again, eventually this gradient will go to zero and you'll have optimized this compression. Okay. So I think I will talk for maybe five more minutes. Maybe we take a take a break. Okay. So, um, so, uh, so I will introduce one last thing, which is how we the DMRG style. So, um, so the DMRG is based on the observation that explicitly evaluating this gradient and following it is actually not necessary if I work in the mixed canonical form. Okay. So, uh, so let's just see why that is true. Okay. So. Let's take this object, and um, once again, let me consider this object here as a vector. And so if this object here is a vector, then this is a vector, and the rest of it is another vector dotted into it. Okay? So the second site here is, I'm thinking of as a vector A, and the whole thing's a scalar, so the, all the other tensors are this vector B. Okay, well, so where vector, vector B is just this. Okay, so I've just thought of this now as a dot product of between two vectors, where site 2 is a vector. And this object, this quadratic object, looks like a product between a vector matrix and a vector where this is the matrix. Okay, all right. And so the minimization of the sum of these terms with respect to the elements of 2, the vector A, is just the minimization of a quadratic problem which is just linear algebra. Okay, this is solved by solving this set of linear equations. So, so that's very simple. It's simple to do. So, so DMRG basically observes that in the matrix product state, everything occurs linearly. So all the operations that you do boil down to linear algebra. That's basically the idea. When you were talking about vector, that's a vector with a lot of indices. It's a vector with a lot of indices. It's a big vector. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, 
Oh, so uh, it's a vector. This is a, I'm thinking of this as a vector with three, the three indices are compound index, if that makes sense. You know, if I can flatten the matrix into a vector, does that make sense? Yeah, so here I'm flattening something with three indices into a vector. Yeah? Yeah. All right. Okay, and so the minimization is performed. Just now I, I, I found the optimum, the minimization of this for the site two, and then you can imagine that you do it site by site. So I do it for site one by solving this linear equation. And then I've got an updated site one, and I'll do it for site two by solving a new linear equation. M equals B. And then I do it for site three by solving a new linear equation. So this is a sweep algorithm that you have in DMRG. You just do it for one site at a time. And then the last thing that I'm going to say is that it's much simpler in mixed canonical form. So this is probably a little bit technical. This is one slide and then we'll have a break. So the cool thing in mixed canonical form is you don't even have to solve this linear equation uh, because I showed you this was the matrix entering into the linear equation, but if I choose mixed canonical form around site one, the trace of the, the contraction of all tenses to the right is just the identity. And so this MA equals B is just A equals B. So, so, the, uh, so in the DMRG, you, you basically work, you try and optimize site one, and you choose the mixed canonical form around site one, and that's equivalent to having done, uh, solved this compression problem. Okay, and so then you change the conical form to site two, and that solves the compression. All right, so, um, so to summarize these two things, um, I just showed you the SVD compression, the variational, out, and, and the second form, the variational compression, where I just minimize the metric. In the variational algorithm, the optimization of each site's tensor depends on everything else. And so if you read the literature and the calculation, um, this is referred to as using the environment. Okay, so the optimization of site one's tensor depends on the values of site two and site three and so forth. Um, in SVD compression, I just change the tensors complete independently, and again, the terminology for this is known as a local update. Now, uh, for matrix product states, actually, the scaling, computational scaling of these two things is exactly the same, so you, you always do this because it's, well, you don't always do this, but you do this often because it's just, it's not really much harder than this, but when we go to tensor product states, tensor networks, local updates are much, much cheaper than computing the environment, and so most calculations do this, even though it's not really the optimal thing to do. Okay, I'm gonna take a break. This is why we all take a break, and... 10 minutes. 10 minutes, all right, okay.